All right, now I'm going to explain to you why. Why I'm mentioning this book. Okay, let me explain to you why. Let me do something real quick. Thank you, brother. I didn't know. Okay, so it is in the final stages. Glory to the Father, Son, and Spirit. The authors came up with an acronym. Acronym. A masterful acronym. Acronym. Okay. Called hands. And we're going to work on that. One of the best ways to refute anti-Trinitarians. And their book is actually grouped around the acronym. The outline follows the acronym called HANDS. HANDS. Okay. You ready for it? HANDS. Okay. The acronym HANDS. Okay. HANDS. So let me get the Bible ready so we can go through it. And I did some series on it. Hands. There you go. Hope you're enjoying this. I hope you don't think it's a waste of your time. I'll be on, Lord willing, as much as I can, because about till the 25th, I have a guest. Pray God bless us. The Lord fill us. The Spirit seals us for the glory of the Father, Son, and Spirit. And that the Lord will have mercy on us in Jesus' name. Anyway, hands. See it on the screen? Okay. Each letter is used to point to the deity of the Lord Jesus Christ that the Bible, Old and New Testaments, testify that Christ is God in an absolute sense, equal to the Father and the Spirit. So let's break it down. H. H is the honors Jesus receives, or I should say, Jesus receives, Jesus receives the honor, honors due to God. In other words, he receives the worship due to God. H. Okay. A. Jesus possesses the attributes, the unique, exclusive, because you got to be careful, because there are attributes that God has that he shares with his creatures, like love and so on. The unique, exclusive attributes of God. That's A. Okay, everyone with me? Let's follow. H, Jesus receives honors due to God. A, Jesus possesses the unique, exclusive attributes of God. Okay? N, Jesus possesses the unique names and names of God. Everyone with me? That's the end. See how beautiful they set it up? Beautiful and easy. Beautiful and easy. And I can give you a taste of each one of them. And we can finish the series I began years ago that I never finished. I'm waiting for my band, which will be June 20, July 27, so I can finish my series Nasser and fight that the, by the grace of God, they don't delete my YouTube channel. We'll see. Anyway. So what is D? D. Jesus performs the unique deeds of God, meaning deeds that only God performs, right? That's D, right? What about S? July 27. Good birthday to be unbanned, brother. What about S? S, Jesus sits on the seat of God, God's throne. You see how they did it? And they grouped the, the book around that outline. So what they do in the book is they will go throughout the Bible and quote all the verses, Old New Testaments, where Jesus is described as possessing these character characteristics that are attributed to the true God and no one else. Okay? Everyone with me there? Do you want me to give you some examples? Some examples? Just to whet your appetite? If you learn this acronym and you learn the material, if you learn the material, study the articles, rebuttals that I've written free of charge, or watch the older sessions. You're going to be able to then find verses for each category. 
each category. Let's take names of God as an example, right? Let's take names of God. So let's go to the Bible. All right, ready? Names belonging uniquely to God. Names belonging uniquely to God that Jesus our Lord possesses. All right, the most obvious. There are many, but the most obvious. Let's go to the most obvious, All right? Okay, you ready? Ready, set, go. Ready. One, two, three. Ha ha. Oh, uh, what is this? Uh, what is this thing you do? Cat one is cheat control. The way of the intercepting fist. Intercepting. Okay. You ready? One example. Hope you're enjoying it. I hope you're learning a lot. Even if you've heard it before, creatures of repetition. We need to hear something repetitively until it becomes second nature. All right. So let's begin. Isaiah 41.4, one of the names that belong to God alone and no one else. Who has worked and done it, calling forth to generations from the beginning? I, Yahweh, am the first, and with the last, I am he. First and last. Now, here the Lord tells you what it means that he's the first and last. Right? Here... It tells you what it means that he's the first and last. Our Lord is the creator of time, of peoples, places, and things. Because notice what he says. Who has worked and done it, calling forth the generation in the beginning? Generations means each generation of creatures. One generation dies, another generation replaces the previous one. Who calls them forth? Who brings them into existence? The creator God. And he's been doing it from the very start. Okay? He's doing it from the very start. What does that mean? Meaning God has been there from the start of creation. He created the first generation of creatures. And he creates each subsequent generation of creatures to the very last one. Do you understand the meaning? It's not enough that you read the Bible. You have to understand it and see the implication. So I'm trying to help bring out the implication. Everyone got the implication? Everyone understand the implication here? He was there to summon the first generation of creatures. So he's there from the start. And he remains forever. So he'll be there with each subsequent generation of creatures because he calls each generation into being. And he'll be there to summon the last generation into existence. So does everyone understand what it means to be first and last? We're getting it. Is it sinking in? I can't move on if you don't give me feedback, guys. All right. This cannot be said of a creature. A creature has not been there from the beginning. If so, because he died. No creature can say, I was there from the first generation. I'll remain to the last generation. When I say no creature, I'm talking about human creatures, right? I'm talking about human creatures. Now. Someone say, oh, but hold on, angels are there. Yeah, but angels were also brought into existence. They were called into existence. So yes, angels were created at the start. God brought them into being, called them into existence from prior non-existence. So even angels were brought into existence. So though they were among the first generation of creatures, so they were brought into, begin, into existence from the beginning. They were not there before the first generation of creatures. Only God was. So yeah, an angel can be there till the end. But the angel had a beginning. The angel is among the first generation of creation. Because when God created heavens and the earth, he created everything in the heavens and the earth, including the angels. Only God was there from before the first, from before the beginning, from the be before creation came into existence. Right? We get what it means? In other words, the title refers to someone who has no beginning, has no end. 
the title refers to someone who's uncreated. And because he's uncreated, he has no beginning. And whose years never end. Because his years never end, he'll be there forever. So you cannot apply this to a creature. Everyone got it, right? I know you've heard this, but you got to hear it over and over again. All right. Isaiah 44, 6. Thus says Yahweh, the king of Israel, his redeemer, Yahweh hosts. I am the first and I am the last. There is no God besides me. When the beginning began, I was there, the first. There was no other God with me. And I'll be there to the very end. In other words, he just told you, there is no other God who's the first and the last. There is no other God who's been there from the very first generation. None. I alone. No one else. All right. Isaiah 48, 12. Hear me, O Jacob, even Israel, whom I called. I'm he, I'm the first, and I'm also the last. So it's clear, right? Now notice, first and the last, that phrase is simply another way of saying A and Z, or Alpha and Omega, the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet, because New Testament is in Greek. In Hebrew, it would be Aleph and Tau, or Aleph and Tov, right? Beginning and the end. First and last. Beginning and the end, Aleph and Tau, or Tov, A and Z, Alpha and Omega, are simply three different ways of saying the same thing. Keep that in mind. Why do I mention that? Because here, Revelation 21, 6 to 7. Then he said to me, they are done. I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without cost. He overcomes, will inherit these things. I'll be his God. He'll be my son. So the God who created all things, who alone is God, is Alpha and Omega, first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. So in English it would be, I'm A and Z, beginning and the end. I was there from the beginning. I'll be there to the end because I caused the beginning to come into existence. And it's simply two different ways of saying, I'm the first and the last. Making sense? Sinking in for everybody? All right. Remember the acronym HANDS. A, Jesus possesses the attributes of God. Attributes no creature can have if he's not God. Well, where do we get that? Here you go. One example. Relation 1, 17, 18. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet like a dead man. He placed his right hand on me. Do not fear. I am the first and the last. Well, who is speaking here? Well, we know it's a true God, but which person? And the living one, another title of God. God calls himself the living one, the one who lives forevermore. And I was dead. There you go. That's Jesus. He just claimed first and the last. First and the last. So he was there from the very beginning. He'll be there at the very end. I died, behold, I'm alive forevermore. The words, I'm alive forevermore, and living one, they too are names of God, attributes of God, first and last, names of God. They're also attributes because the names of God signify characteristics of God. So here Jesus possesses names of God, attributes of God, the living one, the one who lives forevermore, Alpha and Omega, first and last, beginning and the end. Okay, we got it here. Attributes and names. Now, again, let me explain. Names and attributes are synonymous, meaning when you speak of the names of God, those names signify the qualities of God, the characteristics of God. The names of God tell us something about God's nature. So when you say the Holy One of Israel, well, Holy One of Israel means the one who's set apart, and he's the God of Israel. The one that Israel sets apart. Okay? So here's a name that tells us something about his nature. Names and attributes are basically synonymous. A name is a characteristic of God, right? A quality of God. And who's the first last? The one who died. Who's the living one? The one who died. Who lives forevermore? The one who died. That's Jesus. And notice the deeds of God. He has the keys, authority, power over death and Hades. Only God has power over death and Hades. But Jesus says, death and Hades under my control.
Everyone got it? Someone from my ministry, I'm the only one. So you got to contact me. Everyone got it? See how, it's, how it works? Remember, God said also he's Alpha and Omega beginning and the end? Let's keep going. Revelation 22, 12. Let's see first who's speaking. Always read in context. Don't let them run. He who bears witness to these things says, yes, I'm coming quickly. I am coming quickly. Notice who the speaker is. I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Who's coming? The Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit, purge us in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ and your purifying fire. Do that for our loved ones and my daughters. Glory to the Father, Holy Spirit. Who's coming? The Lord Jesus. I am coming quickly in Jesus' name. The one who comes quickly may live in us, increase in us, sit and throne upon our hearts, purify us in your blood, Lord Jesus. Rebuke Satan. Destroy the evil. Crush his head under our feet, Lord. Glory to the Father, Holy Spirit. So no doubt it's Jesus speaking because John tells you he's speaking. Right? Okay. So I am coming quickly. No doubt now we know Jesus. Same chapter. Revelation 22, 12, 13. Behold, I am coming quickly, and my reward is with me, to render to every man according to his work. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the first, last, the beginning, and the end. There you go. He possesses the attributes of God and the names of God, because he's God in the flesh. Okay, that's. Names and attributes. You got you got it? Names and attributes. Hands. Attributes of God that Jesus possesses. And names of God that Jesus possesses. Now, this also shows us Jesus performs the deeds of God. So let's go to deeds of God. It's just to whet your appetite. If you want me to do extensive series on this, I can. Okay. Deeds of God. How does this show, Revelation 22, 12, Jesus performs the deeds of God. Here, watch again, in case you missed it. Behold, I'm coming quickly, my words with me. Let me show you how. You ready? Watch here. Let's do this, okay? Let's go here, Psalm 62, 12, Proverbs 24, 12. Isaiah 40, verse 10, right? 62, 11, right? Okay, watch. Let's see if you catch it. Let's see. Ready? Now we're going to look at Jesus performing the deeds of God. You want me to do D, right? You want me to show you examples for each of the letters, correct? Because I'm here to serve you, use of the Spirit to serve you. So we did A, attributes of God and names of God, right? Okay, now we're going to do deeds of God. And that you, O Lord, belongs, and to you, that to you, O Lord, belongs, Psalm 62:12. Love me, guys. For you repay a man according to his work. You repay a man. According to his work. Okay. Proverbs 24, 12. If you say, behold, we do not know this. Does not he who weighs the hearts understand? And does not he who guards your soul know? And will not he render to man according to his work? Who will repay you according to what you've earned? God. Okay. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, Lord Yahweh will come with strength. Who's coming? Note, who's coming? Lord Yahweh will come with strength. Not a creature. He's coming with his power, with his arm, which means power, ruling for him. He's going to rule in his power. Arm being a metaphor for power. But there are places in which arm refers to Jesus as the very power, eternal power of the Father became flesh. Behold, his reward is with him. And his recompense before him. So he's coming with his reward to repay. He's coming to judge and repay. Who? Lord Yahweh. Still not getting it? Isaiah 62, 11. <clears throat> behold, Yahweh has announced to the end of the earth. Say to the daughter of Zion, behold, your salvation comes. Behold, his reward is with him and his recompense before him. We getting it? 
the Lord Yahweh, Yahweh alone is coming with his reward, recompense, repay everyone according to his or her deeds. It's right there. This is a deed that God performs. All right, now watch what our Lord says. Matthew 16, 27. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels. So we know the Son of Man is the Son of God. God is his Father, and this is Jesus speaking. And will then repay each one according to his deeds. Wait, the Son of Man, who is the Son of God, is coming with his angels to repay each one, everyone, according to their deeds? But we just read in Isaiah 40, verse 10, Lord Yahweh will come with strength. His reward is with him and his recompense before him. Not a creature, but Yahweh. Again, that's what we're told in Psalm 62, 12, Proverbs 24, 12. And here, Yahweh has announced your salvation, meaning him. It comes with his reward and his recompense. So Jesus performs the deeds of God. The deeds that only God performs according to the Hebrew scriptures. All right. Maybe you're still not convinced. Let me show you this. Let me tie this in now. Watch here. Watch here. Let me reverse it. So now we go a different order. Watch here. Watch here. Okay. Let's go to Revelation 22 20. He who bears witness to these things says, Yes, I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. So you can't, even a blind man can see. The one who just spoke, I'm coming quickly. Is Jesus because John says, Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. After you heard Jesus tell him, I'm coming quickly. Okay, let's follow here. Behold, I'm coming quickly. That's Revelation 22 12. Revelation 22 20. Yes, I'm coming quickly. Come, Lord Jesus. You see how much I belabor the point so that you won't miss it. And if you miss it, then the problem's on your part, not me, because I repeat myself millions of times. I am coming quickly. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Behold, I am coming quickly. My reward is with me to render to everyone according to his work. Every man. I am coming quickly. Revelation 22, 12, 20. That's Jesus. But Jesus says it's my reward that I bring so I can repay every man according to his work. But hold on, Jesus. Isaiah 40, verse 10. Behold, Lord Yahweh will come with strength, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. Jesus, it is Yahweh who's coming, coming with his reward and his recompense. But Jesus, you said, you're coming with your reward, and you're going to repay and render to every man according to his work. We got it? Even a blind man can see it, right? Even a blind man can see it, right? All right, hold on. I don't think you're seeing it. So these are the deeds that Jesus performs, which the Hebrew Bible scribes to Yahweh. Again, one more time. Behold, Lord Yahweh will come with strength, with his arm ruling for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. Okay, Jesus speaking. For the Son of Man is going to come in the glory of his Father. God is my Father, I'm the Son, with His angels, and will then repay each one according to His deeds. Right? Chris Ferguson, if you're not watching my streams and reading my posts on Facebook, brother, I don't want to block you. I just posted on my Facebook page what happened, brother. Are you watching and reading my posts? That's disrespect because you're following me, but you don't watch anything I do, huh, brother? I think you need to go, brother. Everyone got it? Talking to someone on Facebook. Why you get banned? I posted on Facebook several days ago. I've been doing streams, and he's asking me, so why are you on my list, brother? You don't read anything I post. Yep, even Stevie Wonder can see it. Okay, hold on. Let me now give you another one in case you missed it. 2, 18, and 23. And I'll give you a few more examples for each one, and then we'll wrap it up. Lord, I'll try to be on at least once a day. If not, bear with me. I have a guest. 
Pray the Lord bless us, strengthen us, fill us with spirit. Pray the Lord, have mercy on us, forgive us for our failures to walk worthy of Jesus. The Lord has blessed me and a very good woman. Pray I can be Jesus to her. And the Lord bring us together in his perfect timing. Anyway, Revelation 2, 18 to 23. Revelation 2, 18 to 23. Notice who's talking. I've already exegeted this passage, brought out the meat of this passage millions of times. So I'm going to be brief. I'm going to be brief. Okay. Revelation 2, 18 to 23. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, this is what the Son of God, the one who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are like burnished bronze says. Now, by the way, the Jehovah Witness Bible reads the same way. The Jehovah Witness Bible reads the same way. These are the passages you can use against Jehovah's Witnesses. Their Bible reads the same way. This is what the Son of God, the one who has eyes like a flame of fire and his feet are or like burnished bronze says. So you can't deny it. You can't get away from it. It's the Son of God speaking. Son of God speaking. Okay, look what he says. He's warning the church. I know your deeds. May our love for our Lord and deeds be greater than it was at the start. And may the Lord have mercy on us that before I finish the race, I'll be sold out for his glory and die glorifying him and never shame him. Lord, never let us to shame him. I know your deeds and your love and faith and service and perseverance and that your last deeds are greater than at first. But I have this against you, that you tolerate the woman Jezebel who calls herself a prophetess. So you put up with a false prophetess, teaches and sees my slaves so they commit sexual morality. May the Lord have mercy. Father, Son, Spirit, in Jesus' name, destroy that from us. Give us grace, Lord, to hate sin and not justify it and eat things sacrifice titles and i gave her time for now notice the heart of the lord here this tells you how loving compassionate our lord is how merciful our lord is he doesn't even want a false prophetess to die and be destroyed he even wants false prophets and prophetesses to live because they're all his creatures so notice he's not a god quick to wrath i even gave her time to repent Instead of repenting, she became more emboldened against me. So guess what I'm going to do? She does not wish to repent of sexual morality. Now, sexual morality, here it's talking about her justifying sexual perversion and idolatry. So she's it's okay. Sexual morality is not a sin. Fornication is not a sin. May the Lord have mercy on us that we never justify it and call it sin. And the Lord have mercy on us. Right, not to excuse it in Jesus' name, may the Lord have mercy. She's saying, No, it's all right, don't worry about it. It's all right, it's not sin. Go ahead and do it. And I'm a prophetess and I speak by the authority of the Lord. And it's okay, you can sacrifice meat idols, it's all right. Syncretism, but there are two types of fornication and adultery. Let me unpack it two types there's the physical type. Do not justify it. As, as long as we realize it's sin and we struggle with it and ask the Lord have mercy, may have mercy on us. It's one thing when you struggle, unless you're a monk or a nun, we struggle with that. We do. It's one thing to acknowledge it's sin, you struggle with it and ask the Lord for mercy. It's another thing when you justify it and not call it sin. See, God is a God of mercy. He'll show you mercy. As long as you don't justify it and as long as you ask the Lord for mercy. What he hates is you then justifying it and excusing it so you have churches that say it's okay homosexuality it's okay lesbianism it's okay to be queer it's okay transgenderism it's okay to fornicate no these are sins that if you struggle with but confess and acknowledge he'll show you mercy you justify them the lord's wrath will be on us may the lord save me save us and give us mercy in jesus name we finish the race everyone with me there you understand the difference? You understand the difference, right? But there's another type of fornication, another type of adultery. Spiritual fornication adultery. Let me unpack that. You'll read chapters like Ezekiel 23, Hosea 11, Hosea chapter 2, where God likens himself to a husband 
and his people his bride. And that's in the Bible. The church is the bride of Jesus Christ. Ephesians 5, 22 to 33. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 to 4. So this is a spiritual marriage. Spiritual husband, spiritual bride, spiritual intimacy, not sexual. But because we are betrothed to our husband, our Lord, we have to stay spiritual virgins. How do you then defy yourself and cheat on your husband spiritually? Here, this out. James 4, verse 4. Here. James 4, 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world sets himself as an enemy of God. When you love the world and the vices of the world and engage in the world and agree with the world, you're now committing spiritual adultery against your husband. See it? James 4.4. 4. You see it there? You see it? Right there. There's another way in which you commit spiritual adultery, spiritual fornication. Another way. Paul tells you. 2 Corinthians 11. Verses 1 of 4. 2 Corinthians 11, verses 1 of 4. Okay? So far, are you with me, right? Here it is. 11, verse 1 of 4. I wish that you would bear with me in a little foolishness, but indeed you are bearing with me. For I'm jealous. I'm zealous for you. Jealous means I'm zealous to make sure you're pure for my Lord. Why? Because Paul likens himself to a spiritual father to the Corinthians because he converted them. So they are his spiritual seed. And he calls them pretty much his virgin daughter collectively. For I'm jealous for you with a godly just for I betrothed you. See, I gave you to one husband. Spiritual. You're my spiritual seed. I father you through the preaching gospel. That's 1 Corinthians 4, 14 and 15. You're my virgin daughter. And I've given you a spiritual husband. And I want you to remain a virgin so you don't shame me when he shows up. So that may present you, I, your father, present you as a pure virgin to Christ. Right? Sinking in? But then he's afraid that the serpent will beguile them and seduce them. How? How does the serpent cause you to lose your spiritual virginity? It's not physical. Here. But I fear that as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness. Your minds, that's how you lose your spiritual virginity. Your minds are corrupted, polluted, tainted, defiled to start believing contrary teachings about God, Christ, right? About the spirit and the gospel. Hold on one second. Dave, I'm on a live stream. What's going on? Okay, brother. Anyway, make sure you do that Barnes and Nobles thing, all right? The Barnes and Nobles email. Okay, buddy. God bless. All right. All right. You with me there? Sorry. This was a very important brother. Your minds will become from simplicity, purity of devotion to Christ. How? For if one comes and preaches another Jesus, the Islamic Jesus, the Mormon Jesus, the Joe Witness Jesus, right? The modalist Jesus, whom we did not preach. Or you receive a different spirit which you did not receive, or a different gospel which you did not accept, you bear this beautifully. That's how you lose your spiritual virginity. That's how you commit adultery spiritually. Do you see it? You saw it, right? You allow anyone, everyone who names the name of Christ into your fellowship, even though he may believe in the Mormon Jesus, the Islamic Jesus, the liberal Jesus. The gay affirming Jesus, right? The secular Jesus, the Hindu Jesus, the Buddhist Jesus, the modalist Jesus, the Unitarian Jesus. And Paul says, that's how you know Satan has seduced you. See? That's how you know, right? So remember two ways of committing adultery, physically or spiritually. Now, which, which sin do you think is worse in the eyes of God? Because not all, you want me to prove that to you? Not all sins are equal. Some sins are worse than others. Some sins are more heinous and disgusting to God than others. You want me to prove that too? 
because it's your class and I want the spirit to lead. May have mercy on me and transform me to love the Lord Jesus Christ. I love you, Holy Spirit. I am in love with you. Have mercy on me. Own me, Lord, please. And don't give me what I deserve. Okay, you want me to show you that? That not all sins are equal. Some sins are worse. You want me to show you that too? All right. Man, our churches. Pray for our churches to start catechizing because you guys are hungry. Can you pray for me that God will have mercy on me and purify me and I finish the race and glorify the Lord Jesus Christ even unto death, forgiven by his grace and mercy so that I can be used in the Spirit to keep feeding you because the Spirit is a teacher? My goodness, man. Woo. Here, let me prove to you from Scripture. Not all sins are equal. Not all sins. Some sins are worse than others. Here, Scripture. You want Scripture, right? All right. Okay, let me go back here. A lot of topics. I hope you're still enjoying it. All right. Here you go. From Scripture. You ready? You guys ready? All right. Matthew 5, 19. Here it is. Whoever then annuls, cancels out one of the least of these commandments. Did you catch it? If you are a sharp, discerning reader, illumined by the Spirit, not all commandments are equal. Did you catch it? Some commandments are greater than others, more important than others, carry greater weight. Here it is. Least. You know what that means, right? If there are least commandments, that means not all the commandments are on the same footing. Some commandments are more important, are greater in in terms of importance and culpability and responsibility. Do you see it? Amen, Pierre. May the Lord hear you. You see it? That's why you know the ancient churches, Orthodox Catholic Church, are right. When the Catholic Church tells you they're venial sins and mortal sins, they weren't making it up, you Protestants. They were not making it up. They're coming up with terms, which is in the scriptures. Some commands are greater in status and importance and bring about greater judgment or greater rewards. Even the Lord, when he's asked, what are the greatest commandments? See, if they're greatest, that means they're least. Here is the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. Right? All right. But if you break the least of the commandments and teach us others to do the same, because they're not important, because it's easy to get a free pass with a commandment that's not as important, right? In terms of its culpability, that you'll be culpable responsibility. It doesn't have the level of importance and priority. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. The Lord says, no, no, no. You better not be lax even when it comes to the least of the commandments. You better be zealous for all the commandments, even the ones that are not as much of a priority as others. Right? Okay. Because why? If you do that, you shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So now you learn several facts. Not all commandments are equal. Some are greater than worse. Some bring greater rewards or greater judgments than others. And in the kingdom, we won't all have the same rank. Some will be greater in rank than others. Here, from the holy lips of our blessed Lord. Shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. Amen, Gigi, in Jesus' name. Right? But whoever does and teaches them, if you do the least one, you shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. You want to be great in the kingdom? Prioritize all of them. Do all of them and teach others to all of them, even the ones that seem less significant. This is our Lord. So you learn, right? Okay. Still not convinced? Oh, you have a little faith? Mark 3, 28 to 30, which is also Matthew 12, 31, 32. Truly I say to you, all sins shall be forgiven the sons of men. Whatever blasphemies they utter. Whatever blasphemes the against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness. You see, here's a sin where you blaspheme the Spirit, no forgiveness, it's over. That tells you not all sins are equal because all other sins can be forgiven. But when you blaspheme the Spirit, that is the unpardonable sin, but is guilty of an eternal sin. 
because they're seeing he has an unclean spirit. Right? Anyone got it? Hope you're learning. All right, let's go here. John 19, 10, 11. What does our Lord say about Caiaphas, the priest who handed him over? Who is more guilty, more culpable, who will be punished more severely? Pilate or Caiaphas who handed Jesus over? Watch here. So Pilate said to him, you do not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and I have authority to crucify you? Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me. You're nothing but a maggot under our control, Father, Son, and Spirit, unless it had been given you from above. Now watch here. For this reason, he who delivered me to you, Caiaphas, has the greater sin. Oh, so some sins are greater than others. So Pilate, you're guilty. You're culpable. But Caiaphas is more guilty, more culpable. And his sin is worse than yours. Now, why is that? By the way, JT, God bless you, brother. I saw your Facebook post. You're a one handsome stud muffin, baby. I don't want to give out your location, but one day when I'm in New York, you know, I'm in the Bronx, you know, you're me, you know, you're a New Yorker, you're a New Yorker. I'll be checking you out. Right? Can anyone tell me why Caiaphas? Yeah. Pray for us, Catholic Biblicists. Pray for all of us. God, purge us and purify us. The blood of Jesus Christ, Father, Son, Lord Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit. Don't justify it. It's all sin. And the reason why I'm asking is because you're going to have to think of a woman lust for her. Please, Father, forgive us. Lord Jesus, have mercy. Holy Spirit, in Jesus' name, have mercy on you, Lord. Ya alayhi, hey, alayhi. You're my God. Bless this beautiful queen that you gave me. All right, anyway. Everyone got it? We get it? You see the biblical basis? So you think these guys who teach the Bible know what they're talking about, like Mike Winger or this other guy. Brethren, stay to the ancient paths. Stay with the ancient churches. Don't fall prey for people who are charismatic or have a large following. The ancient paths are not broken. They're preserved by the Almighty Triune God. Go to the ancient paths, you Catholics Orthodox. I pray you'll come together as one. But until then, your home is there. Do what you can and ask the Lord for mercy, for he's a God of infinite love. He doesn't delight in destroying you. But here you go. Now, do you guys know why? Look, San, I've answered that five million times. Right? No. Look, Santa, let me explain to you. The one who commits the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit doesn't care about the Holy Spirit, doesn't care about God or Jesus or the things of God. Anyone who's troubled and convicted and scared they blaspheme the Holy Spirit means they didn't blaspheme the Holy Spirit. You don't understand the gravity of blaspheming the Holy Spirit. That means you have resisted the Holy Spirit, resisted the Holy Spirit, angered the Holy Spirit because you're stiff necked rebellious, calloused, and could care less about the things of the Spirit. And now the Holy Spirit is done with you, and he hands you over to delight in your filth. So the person who's committed about blasphemy of the Spirit is a person who could care less about God. To him, God is a joke. The one who keeps being worried that he's blasphemy, that means he hasn't. I mean, come on, guys. You with me there? That's one of the signs. The one who still cares and is fearful of God has not blasphemed the Holy Spirit. A clear sign of blasphemy the Holy Spirit is the person who thinks religion's a joke, God is a joke, Christ is a joke, God forbid, spiritual God forbid, and laughs at the faith and justifies his sin. That person is so dead to him, hearing about God is a joke. Let me change the topic, Vayoga. For you, because it's your world and you're important. Forget my topic. Okay. Vagyok C4. All right. Now, did you see it? Not all sins are equal. Not all sins are equal. The one who delivered it, and I still didn't get an answer to the question. Why is Jesus saying Caiaphas is more guilty than Pilate before I move on? Why is Jesus saying that? 
Caiaphas, the high priest, is more guilty than Pilate. I didn't get an answer to that. Anyone? What's the answer? Do you know? No, not false witness. No, not false witness. You got it, Nat. Yes, because he's a Jew who's a high priest who knows the Old Testament, knows the scriptures, which means he has no excuse. Yeah, you got it, folks. But you understand what that means? The more you know, the more you're, you've been privileged, the more grace you receive, the greater your judgment when you sin. That's Jesus' point. We don't expect Pilate, who doesn't read the Old Testament, who is a Gentile, a, sin, a Gentile, to know the Old Testament prophecies. Caiaphas has no excuse because he's a Jew who's a priest who works in the temple and must know the law and must know about the prophecies, especially when they're pointed out to him and Jesus is fulfilling them and doing miracles. His judgment is worse. So what's the implication? The more you know, the more you've been favored, the more revelation, like me, God have mercy on me. I don't end up being like James White, Anthony Rogers, or Kai in Jesus' name. The greater the judgment. Right? Making sense now, right? All right, let's continue. Other examples, that not all sins are equal. Here, Hebrews warns the Jews that the covenant of our Lord Jesus, his new covenant, the law he brought, the sacrifice he offered, his own life, superior to the old covenant and the law of Moses. Now look what he says. Watch here. Not all sins are equal. Not all sins are equal. And no, Jay, it means that he had no excuse not to know. He had no excuse not to know, meaning the prophecies were there. Jesus is pointing to them and doing miracles so that he had no excuse not to know, but he remained stubborn in his tradition, and he allowed his tradition to pervert his interpretation of the Bible. You see? Not all traditions are good. Many are from God. And some traditions are neutral. But there are traditions inspired by Satan that blind you from interpreting the Bible correctly, that force you to butcher the Bible, to agree with your tradition. And that's what happened to Caiaphas. Because of his tradition, which he read into the Old Testament, which he used to pervert the Old Testament, he did not want to accept the plain reading of the text. It's not that it wasn't plain. It could be made plain to him, but he cannot accept it. No, it can't mean that. Don't we see that today? When you show anti-Trinitarians the clear, irrefutable proof for the Trinity or deity of Christ, and you demolish their objections, they still refuse to accept. You see? They still refuse to accept. A lot of traditions are good because they're from God. Some traditions are neutral. They're not good or bad. You're free. But there are traditions inspired by Satan, like the five points of Calvinism. The five points of Calvinism God saved me from. Glory to the Father. Glory to the Son, Lord Jesus. Glory to the Holy Spirit. In my innocence, I didn't know any better. So God has mercy. He meets you where you're at. That's why I could not continue believing Calvinism because he made it clear to me. It's not biblical. This God of Calvinism is a tyrant, a despot, a cold narcissist who's all about glorifying himself. You with me there? All right. So now watch what he says about the law of Moses and the death penalty it brought. And contrast how much more severe your punishment will be if you violate the law of Christ. Here, not all sins are equal. Roger. For if the word spoken through angels, that's talking about the law of Moses, proved unalterable, and every trespass and disobedience received a just penalty. And that's the law of Moses, and it's inferior to the law of our Lord Jesus. How will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? 
if the law of Moses brought such punishments, how much more severe your punishment when you turn away from this salvation where God became flesh and God offered his human life and shed his blood to save you, our Lord Jesus. And now you turn away from it. That salvation first spoken by the Lord was confirmed to us by those who heard. God also testifying with them, both by signs and wonders, by various miracles and by gifts of the Holy Spirit according to his own will. You understand the argument from the lesser to the greater? You understand the argument, lesser to the greater? He's saying, look, the law of Moses brought about just penalties if you violated the law. What do you think is going to happen to you when you hear the gospel, hear the message, embrace it, but decide to turn away and now condemn Jesus as a false Messiah and treat the blood he shed as nothing special? What do you think is going to happen to you? How much more severe your punishment? Right? And then here, Hebrews 10, 26, 29, he makes the same point because he's talking to Jews. Hebrews 10, 26, 29, if, for if we go on sinning willfully, and the sin means if you're not willfully of your own volition are going to turn away from Jesus, turn away from the law and the covenant he brought, and now think that Jesus is not the Son of God, but he was a criminal and blasphemer, and his blood is nothing special. Now watch another way of blaspheming the Holy Spirit because people say, how do you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Here you go. Here's another way. If you go on sinning well after seeing knowledge of the truth, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sins. It's over for you because Jesus is the final sacrifice. If you now turn away from that one sacrifice and you reject Jesus and condemn him as a blasphemer, there's nowhere else for you to turn. It's over. Watch. So there is no more sacrifice because he's the final sacrifice but a terrifying expectation of judgment and the fury of a fire which will consume the adversaries. Now watch the argument lesser to greater. As great as the law of Moses was, the law of Christ is superior. Anyone who has set aside the law of Moses dies without mercy by the mouth of two or three witnesses. If you apostatize, if you turn away from the law of Moses and reject the God of Moses, you have to be killed in the commonwealth of Israel. If two or three witnesses were reliable men of integrity, how much more worse, see, not all sins are equal. How much more worse punishment? Did I now prove to you biblically, not all sins are equal? Some sins are worse than others? Moab, that's 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. I'm going to read it for you because you mentioned it. How much more worse punishment do you think? Much more severe of a punishment for committing this sin. What sin? The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. How do you blaspheme the Holy Spirit? Think he will deserve who has trampled under the foot, underfoot the Son of God. Now you say, the one you worship the Son of God? No, he's a criminal blasphemer. I was wrong. And as regarded as defiled the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified. Now you think his blood was nothing special. That blood shed wasn't the blood of my Savior, but a criminal who deserved to die. And in doing that, you've insulted the Spirit of grace. God in his favor sent your spirit to convince you who Jesus is. Now you're saying the spirit lied and bore false witness, blaspheming the Holy Spirit. You see? Did I now convince you from Scripture not all sins are equal? Don't let anyone tell you otherwise. Catholics, you got it right all along. Orthodox, you got it right. Because you are more biblical than these Protestants think. Because they think it's sola scripta, total scripture, and they don't know the scriptures. And here, you want to see the biblical basis for mortal sins, sins that lead to death, and sins that don't? Here it is, 1 John 5, 16, 17, quoted in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And you guys think these Catholics who've been around for so long don't know the Bible. Are you that arrogant? You think it was only the Reformers who knew what the Bible taught? 1 John 5, 16 and 17. Why do you think hundreds of thousands are leaving Protestantism for the ancient paths? Like one person told me, when I read the Bible, I became Protestant. When I understood the Bible, I became Catholic or Orthodox. You get my point? If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, you see, there are sins that don't lead to death. He shall ask and God will 
for God, she'll ask, and God will for him give light to those who commit sin not leading to death. There is a sin that leads to death, sin to death. I do not say that he should make requests for this. All our righteousness is sin, and there is a sin that, that doesn't lead to death. There you go, the biblical basis. Okay. So with that said, with that said, when I was talking about that, let's go back to the deeds, right? This was the point. What were we talking about? Revelation 2, 18 and 23. The deeds of Christ. Remember that? Now that we got that in perspective, okay? Now we got that in perspective, right? Yep. Now let's go. By the way, a brother mentioned this passage. If you come to know the gospel and you come to know Jesus and turn away, you're now worse off and your judgment is much worse than when you hadn't heard the gospel. And this is why Paul Peter says this. Here, Peter. 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. Here. Here, 2 Peter 2, 20 to 22. For if they are overcome, people who came and embraced the gospel, confessed Jesus, got baptized, and were in the church, only now to pervert the gospel, fall away to damnable heresies, justifying immorality, for if they are overcome, having both escaped the defilements of the world, when they came to know the Lord, they died to the world and its vices by coming to know who the Lord and Savior is, Jesus Christ. But then, having again been entangled in them, falling back to it, now justifying it. That's the context. They're justifying it. Oh, Jesus paid it all. Doesn't matter. Then the last state has become worse for them than the first. You see? Thank you, Hope. Can you pray God will purify me and purge me and forgive me and the Spirit fill me and I walk worthy of the Lord Jesus Christ and be patient with me and I finish the race with integrity? Because believe me, my sins are great. My struggles are great. I'm not better than you guys, and I don't think that. For it would be better for them. Better for them. Notice. They would have been better off and their judgment less severe. Not to have known the way of righteousness, then having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment, and then on to them. The message of the true proverb has happened to them. A dog returns to its own vomit. I don't see Jesus in you, Peter. Why are you call them dogs? And a sow or a pig, after washing, returns to wallowing in the mire. Right? We got it? Amen, Jose. Not because of me, because of the Holy Spirit. Right, brother? Can you give the Holy Spirit glory and ask the Holy Spirit to have mercy on me if you believe the Spirit's using me? Ask the Holy Spirit to have mercy on me and purify me and love me and give me the power to love the Father, Lord Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit. And I'm blessed with a good woman, man, honestly. Pray God's will will be done. Good woman. She deserves better, but God is good. Pray I can be Jesus to her. Okay? Honestly. That's grace. You get what you don't deserve. Glory to the Father's Holy Spirit. May He never give me what I deserve. Right? So you see it? Now let's finish with the deeds of our Lord. Deeds of our Lord. Okay? Here it is. This is what the Son of God says. So notice who's speaking, the Son of God. So I told you how you can commit immorality, right? Physically or spiritually. So He gave her time to repent. She doesn't want to. So what did He do? What does our Lord do? The Lord is patient. He'll rebuke you and chase you to get your attention. But if you keep persisting and you do not repent, then what does he do? He will then bring hell on your uh, in your life, trials in your life, calamities in life, even sickness and illness. Behold, I will throw her on a bed of sickness. I'm going to cut some diseases, illnesses are because of unconfessed sin. Some trials are because of that. I did, did a session recently on it. And those who commit adultery with her. Now here, adultery with her means spiritual. Meaning those who follow her, those who obey her, those who follow her instruction, they're committing spiritual adultery. Right? So what I'm going to do to them, unleash hell on them. 
They're going to do trials and tribulations until unless they repent of her deeds. See, again, this is his heart. I don't want them to die. So I'm doing all I can to get their attention. This destroys Calvinism, folks. The lie of tulip, you Calvinists. Because if God had chosen them for salvation, and according to you, he would regenerate them and empower them to obey. So what is this, a game? According to you Calvinists? According to you Calvinists, they cannot turn and repent and be faithful unless the Lord enables them. So is this a game? You're blaspheming the Lord of Scriptures with your Calvinism. Die to it, repent. Right? So let's finish it. What's the point, though? The point is deeds. Jesus performs the deeds of God. And if they don't repent then, notice Jesus has power over life and death. He can kill you or make you alive. He controls life and death. That is an action of God. God controls life and death. So here, attributes, deeds of God. And I will kill her children with pestilence. That's, again, the deeds of God. God makes alive or causes you to die. These are the qualities of God. So these are A and D, attributes of God, deeds of God. But now watch again, the deeds and attributes of God. So you have both attributes of God and deeds of God here. What do I mean? Now let me simplify it so you can see. Jesus is speaking, right? Son of God. So you don't miss it. Relation 2.18. And to the angel of the church in Thyatira write, this is what the Son of God, the one who has eyes like a flame of fire, and his feet are like burnished bronze, says. So it's God, the Son speaking. What does he say? And I will kill her children pestilence, and all the churches will know that I am he who searches the hearts and the minds. I search all hearts. So I'm aware of everything and everyone. I'm aware of all you do and say. And I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. And I'm a just God who will pay you perfectly according to what you deserve. No injustice with me. So I'm aware of all of you. I'm aware of all your deeds. I know what you do. And I'm going to repay you according to what you earn. So these people earned judgment and death. So that's what I'm going to give them. And you're going to know that's who I am. The one who searches minds and hearts. And will give to each one of you according to your deeds. Now watch who Jesus claimed to be. Jeremiah 17, 10. I, Yahweh, search the heart. I, Yahweh, search your heart. I test in the most being, even to give to each man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Yahweh says, it is I who will search your hearts and test your innermost being, your kidneys. And then I will give to each man according to his ways, according to what he's earned, the fruit of his deeds. But that's what Jesus said. That I am he who searches the minds and hearts, and I will give to each one of you according to your deeds. So Jesus just claimed to be Yahweh. He performs the deeds of Yahweh. He performs the deeds of Yahweh. Right? And he possesses the attributes of Yahweh. What do I mean? Notice, he's the one who will pay and judge you accordingly. That's the deeds of Yahweh. But notice, he has the attributes of Yahweh. What do I mean? In order for him to repay you according to what you've earned, he must be aware of everything you've said and done. He must know what you're thinking, what you're saying, what you're doing. And he must know that for all creatures from the beginning to the end, because he's going to repay everyone according to what they've deserved. He's going to give them perfect payment. That means not only does he perform the deeds of Yahweh, he possesses the attributes of, of Yahweh. A, attributes, omniscience, omnipresence, because he sees and he's aware. Omnipotence, that's hands. Everyone got it? Hands. And the system, that would be A and D. Now, let me give you honor. And then... What, what I'll do is I can do some more tomorrow. We can go through this systematically. Let me stay. Yeah, let me see. Should I do H? Honors that Jesus receives that are due to God? Or do you want me to do S? Jesus sits on the seat of God. You want me to do that? Which one do you want me to do? We'll wrap it up. Lord willing, I'll do another session on this. 
during the week. Do you want S? He sits on the seat of God or H? He receives the honors due to God. S? All right, we got, okay, S it is. All right, S it is. All right, you ready? Okay, man. Let me do the S, man. All righty then. The S. The S. The S, the S. La, 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 la. All right. Yeah, let's do this. I'm sorry, 16. Watch here. Psalm 115.16 113.5. Just to whet your appetite. 115.16. The heavens are the heavens of Yahweh, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. So now, what does this mean? It means God owns heaven and earth, but he has given men dominion over the earth. He's allowed the sons of men, men to rule the earth under his headship. But the heavens are his, hands off, they're mine. Okay? They belong to Yahweh. Now, notice this is a rhetorical question, meaning to ask the questions, answer it. Who is like Yahweh our God, the one who sits on high? Psalm 113.5. Who is like Yahweh our God, the one who sits on high? Then I'm almost done. Okay. What's the answer? To ask it is to answer it. So what's the answer? Who is like Yahweh who sits on high? Vag Yog doesn't get it, poor guy. He's slower than Muhammad. He doesn't get it. What's the answer? This is a rhetorical question. Ask the questions to answer it. What's the answer here? Is there anyone who sits and thrown on high? That's okay, Vag. That's why I love you, sir. I know you're Armenian with that name. You're a good man. What's the answer? Come on, guys. Give me some feedback. To ask the question is to answer it. Who is like Yahweh who sits on high? What's the answer, folks? Yahweh our God. Who is like him who sits on high? Oh, my goodness. You guys are slow. Jay, you disappointed me, dude. You got to leave New York, brother. Okay, one more time. Guys, are you that slow, honestly? I mean, I love you guys. I'm not trying to, but, man, dude, you, you don't get it? JT, brother, can you do me a favor? Don't comment anymore for a week because I'm getting blockitis. Come on, man. Who is like Yahweh, our God who sits on high? Daniel, you know I'm going to block you too, right? One more person says, Jesus, he's getting blocked. Who is like Yahweh, our God who sits on high? The one who sits on high. To ask the question is answer it. To answer it. No one. How are you going to mention Jesus when the name Jesus wasn't given to him after he became flesh from the virgin? What do you mean, Jesus? This is Old Testament, man. Pierre, your question is going to make me want to hang myself. Who is like Yahweh or God, the one who sits on high? God. You think that's an answer, dude? Are you serious? Who is like Yahweh or God, the one who sits on high? Yahweh. We know Yahweh sits on high. Who is like him that does it? To then repeat, it's Yahweh. Is this the public school system? Pierre, did you go to public school? Is this our tax dollars being wasted? Yes, old world boy. The answer is no one. No one sits on high. You guys didn't figure it out when we read the verse before it? Here. The heavens are the heavens of Yahweh. He owns them, hands off. If though he owns the earth, he lets men rule. So if he owns the heavens, then who is sitting enthroned on high, in the heavens on high? No one but him. No one but him, folks. You guys, you're killing me, man. Dude, I got thrown out of high school. I hated school. I hated grammar school.
I got thrown out in third year of high school because I didn't attend. So they wasted their tax dollars on me. But, dude, what's your excuse, you guys? You guys, what's your excuse? Vakyok, would it be wrong if I blocked you, dude? Would it be wrong if I block you? Vakyok, I'm going to give you a third chance. Three strikes, you're out. Who is like Yahweh, our God, who sits on high? The one who sits on high. Vakyok, you got third chance. I'm going to send you out of here. All right. The answer is what? Nobody, right? Nobody. Nobody, right? No one sits enthroned in heaven besides Yahweh. Yahweh alone is on the throne. We got it now? Ooh, Lord have mercy on us. We got it? Please tell me you got it so I can move on and finish the point. Thank you, child of the anointed. All right, even though you have two N's in your name. By the way, I don't know if you misspelled it deliberately. Okay, so who sits on high, right? Okay. Hebrews 1.3. Paul knows the Old Testament. He knows his Bible. Look what he says. Hebrews 1.3. Who is the radiance of his glory. The, Jesus is the radiance of God's glory. The exact representation of his nature. So he possesses the fullness of the divine nature. Every essential attribute of God he possesses because he's the exact imprint of God's nature, identical to the Father nature. And because he possesses all the attributes of God, meaning he's almighty, one of the attributes of God, he is almighty enough to preserve all creation by his powerful word. But now, who having accomplished cleansing for sins, sat at the right hand of the majesty on high. So Jesus sits on high. Same words in the Greek of the Septuagint, on high, on high. So no one sits on high besides Yahweh, who is our God. Yet Jesus, who's not the Father, sits on high at the right side of the Father. He with the Father sits on high. But we're told no one sits on high besides Yahweh. That means the Father is Yahweh our God, but so is the Son. For the Son to sit with the Father at the Father's right side, sit with him on high, meaning he with the Father is that Yahweh, because no one else sits on high. So he sits on the seat of God. We got it? Now let me show you the Greek. The Greek, the Greek. -la 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 the Greek. Watch here. Well, before I'm going to, I'm going to go here. Aleppo. Paul, who would have known the Old Testament in Greek. By the way, let me give you the link here. If you want to read the English translation of the entire Greek Old Testament called the Septuagint, here's the link. Here's the link. Oh my God, here is the link. Oh, where is the love that you've been dreaming of? Okay, now watch. We go to Psalm. Now in the Psalm, we Psalm 112. Psalm 112. Go here. You're gonna you're gonna see the Greek in a minute. Psalm 112. Let's go to verse five. Who is as the Lord our God who dwells in the high places? Okay, watch here to your right to the Greek. Tis os kyrios o theos imon o en ipsilis katikun katikun. Now watch here. O N Ipsilis, the in high. O N Ipsilis, katikun, dwelling. Okay, watch, watch these Greek words. Okay, watch these Greek words. We'll put it on the screen because they're going to look familiar, especially N Ipsilis. Thank you, Sterix. Okay. Now let's go here. Watch Hebrews 1 3 in the Greek. Hebrews 1 3 in the Greek. Bible Hub. All things. Okay. 
having made, sat down a Kathisen in Dexia at the right, Tis Megalusunis and Hypsilis. Does that look familiar? And Hypsilis. Same two words. Same two words. Only thing is it has O and the in the high. Same two words. Do you see it? Let me enlarge the screen. Look at the last two words on your screen. And Ipsilis. Those are the very words of Psalm 112, verse 5. See it? Everyone got it? In other words, Jesus sits on the seat of God, a seat that only the true God sits on, and Jesus sits there with the Father. How? Because he's not the Father, but he is Yahweh God. See the same words? In case you missed it, Hebrews 1.3, and Ipsilis, go back here. Here it is, verse 5, O-N Ipsilis. This is how you use hands, that acronym hands, to prove that the Bible overwhelmingly shouts, affirms Jesus as God Almighty in the flesh.